Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is uh, Devin Rodenizer. I am a project manager from AirUP Laboratories out in Salt Lake City. And today, we're going to talk to you a little bit about our experience incorporating the Covaris focused ultrasonification into a fully automated NGS uh, work cell. I'll give you a little overview of the presentation today. So just an, a quick uh, overview of AirUP Laboratories, if you may or may not be familiar with us. A little overview of the of our automated next generation sequencing work cell, and then go in a little bit about the Kavaris technology and the benefits of that technology, and then just go into the, the meat of the presentation, which is our experience incorporating the Kavaris into our work cell. So, if you're not familiar with AUP, we're a non national nonprofit reference laboratory located in Salt Lake City. Um, we have over 3,000 diagnostic tests and we really run the gambit of a lot of different testing. So genetics, molecular oncology, pain management, pediatrics, we have a lot of, uh, definitely a lot of different testing and we employ about 4,000 individuals now at this point. So we're a pretty large lab. And we actually just broke ground on a new um, space for us that's a 200,000 square foot addition of lab space and we just broke ground on that and we've got about a year out but that's going to be a new building for us because we're growing that and we're already estimating that by the time it's done and occupied we're going to have to start on the next building. We're going to help grow that building pretty quickly. A little bit of automation team. So I'm part of the automation team at AirUP. But this group formed out of, in 2008 with two mechanical engineers as kind of an offshoot of our group that does um, support and service internally and they really were there to start doing some customized automation and really this team has grown but they've always historically been focused on pre-analytical automation so we're most known really for our automated track and sorters we've seen there's a lot of videos out of our system on YouTube and our pipette to light system so we really focus a lot of our efforts on the the pre-analytical portions of that but now the team has grown to over 30 dedicated members and we've really been working on these integrated automation solutions. And in 2016, we expanded into the laboratory with the next generation sequencing work cell. We've consolidated our liquid handler group into one group and brought that into our automation group. And then working on automation for the actual clinical labs such as pipette to light. So going into our, our actual work cell, we had a lot of goals that were set by our lab management and medical directors of that lab. Um, there were some pretty lofty goals for us to, to hit with this work cell. So they wanted a system that was highly scalable, high throughput, minimum staff interactions, minimum downtime, operate under CAP and CLIA regulations, and simultaneously process multiple workflows for germline and oncology testing. So it's a really simple, very easy thing for us to have to done all of this on one entire, on one work cell itself. If you're not really familiar with NGS testing, so the basic steps of NGS testing is do nucleic acid extraction, so DNA or RNA, um, move into library preparation, hybridization and capture, and then into sequencing. What's made our, um, our challenge with this work cell and, the, and then with the Kavaris, um, a lot more challenging than normal is that we actually have four different extraction methods, we have five different library prep methods, and three different sequencing methods. So trying to do all of that into one work cell, it's a big challenge. So our work cell focuses only on the library preparation and hybridization capture. It doesn't make sense to actually work, worry about automating sequencing and nucleic acid. There's lots of automation out there available to do DNA and RNA extractions. But this created unique challenges for us also, as we have multiple processes, multiple sample types, and it creates a highly complex network of workflows. So you go from what four extractions may converge into one extra, um, library prep workflow, and then to all three different sequencers, or they may just stay separate the whole way through. So it, it makes it a very complex um, network to deal with. So it really required a unique solution. So we're really excited to show you this brief video. I'll warn you, it's a little, choppy because of the connection here between this monitor and this screen. Um, but you guys are actually, we're excited because you're the first ones outside of AirUP lab to actually see the work cell. So I'm going to walk through just a little bit of it. So this is our work cell um, sitting on a precise arm. We're moving through. We have two stackers, a four scene and ambient. This actually has all of our consumables and samples and every, pretty much anything the work cell needs. Moving down this precise rail to one of our handoff uh, nest locations, so we have 
There's a lot of empty space on that first rail, but that's for future expansion plans that we have. So we went ahead and built the system planning for the next few uh, five years or so. And now it's a little bit of a delay here, but <laughs> switching arms. Um, and then you'll see the first two of two T cans. So we're on the clean side of the lab right now. So all of the pre amplification sections, but we have two T can 1080s. Both of these do all the, the library prep and these are really the workhorses of the system itself. Coastal genomics, we have a light bench for all of our QC. Agilent centrifuge for just quick spin downs. We just have a few uh, small spin downs. We have a CAPS 500 sticky sealer for the Kavaris plate. And then of course the Kavaris, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, this is our, our beautiful Kavaris that we worked with Kavaris again to, <laughs> to go through. So then passing through the airlock. Um, so we're now moving on to the dirty side. So obviously in production, there's a wall here and these, these sides won't actually be open at the same time um, to eliminate contamination. But move to our other precise arm. We have a, another handoff nest. Um, and if you've seen that there's actually some biohazard bins on the bit, on the system itself, it's because as reagents expired or used, it, the system auto dis disposes them versus leaving them aligned. The we also have two TCAN 1080s, again, three arm systems. We have components above and components below doing all of the different work that needs to be done for these, for the NGS prep. Um, we also then here are coming up on our stacker of eight on the deck thermal cyclers that were taken off the deck. <laughs> um, this was to free up our, th our tea cans to do a lot more processing um, instead of having to just be used up for, for thermal cyclers. Again, another centrifuge and then our combi dancer. So there's one component where you have to dry down the samples before hybridization. So we actually went with the, the combi dancer to dry down those samples because no one really makes an automated vacuifuge, um, included headage, which all they make is automated centrifuges. So. And then again, another 4C um, and ambient stacker. And this line actually looks pretty long, and it is, so it, can, it goes across two different rooms, but that's necessary for the amount of testing that we're talking about and the, and the different complexity of the testing that we have. So a few of the work cell uh, key components and features that we have. Uh, we have the centralized robotic frames, as you saw with the precise arms in those. Those just deliver the samples um, to the different work cell components. We have the status lights, so it's easy for user identification of what's going on with that card. Is it idle? Is it offline? Is it in error state? And then we have the docking cards. All of our instrumentation are kept on these docking cards um, in order to be able to swap them out easily. And what, that what we have is each card has a docking mechanism, and as soon as it hits the central frame, it's instantly powered and networked, and the system can go back online. And each one is uniquely keyed, so if we have to t deal with a robot, we have to do maintenance on it, we can take all the cards out, put the cards back in, but there's no chance of swapping them around. So as soon as they're swapped back on, the system reinitializes and it goes back to live. And so if, you, if you've dealt with automation, you know it's generally so it's hardware, but it's a lot of software. And a system like this is a lot of software. So we have genetic, um, genealogics, clarity, limbs, so really three different different parts of our software. So we have the limbs, we have the scheduling software, so we're utilizing Biosero's GBG or Green Button Go, and then the Kavara Sonolab instrument um, software. So really the, the limbs is the deposit of protocols, steps, everything. It's just really the lab's SOP, but down to a granular level where you mostly just, when you have a limbs, usually it's very high level, major steps in the process. We have to get down to the nitty gritty that I'm moving it to a centrifuge, and that's a step in the limbs. Um, and then BioSera actually just reads from the limbs and then executes the protocol. This makes a lot more programming up front, but what this does is it allows us a lot more flexibility. So when things change, we only have to change one system versus every system. And if you work in CLAP and CLIA, you know how much validation you have to do every time you touch a system. So, And then this Kavara Synolab software actually executes uh, the specified method requested by the scheduling software, and then all of that information is passed back up through to the limbs and log files, and everything is kept um, as necessary by CAP and CLIA. So now actually talking about DNA fragmentation, <coughs> really it creates a unique challenge for us on this automated system. So really when we started this, we needed consistency. We needed automation friendly. We needed something that can handle a wide variety of sample types and a very highly variable specimen quality. 
Our ra samples range from whole blood that was collected two days ago, perfectly refrigerated or kept at ambient as it was supposed to, to FFP blocks that have been sitting in a drawer for 30 years. So we really have a large range of sample quality coming in um, that, we, that we have to deal with. And so we collaborated with Kavaris to build a customized mechanical fragmentation utilizing the Kavaris LE220R+, which you see in this picture. Um, and really, that it was the, everything that we needed. It gave us consistent results, it was automation friendly, and it really have, gave us the fine tuning we needed for our various sample types. If you aren't familiar with the Kavaris um, Adaptive Focus Acoustics or the AFA technology, it's really nice because it's, you know, it's a water bath, it sends these um, uh, acoustic burst through the water bath hitting the, the vessel and that's what fragments the DNA and that's defined by just a few parameters and those parameters give you just finite control over every aspect of this so if you need something sheer between 100 and 150 base pairs you can tune everything to get there or if you need it a wider range of 100 to 500 base pairs you can tune it to that so that makes it very nice so that we can adjust this for based on every one of our needs for the different workflows. And it's really just a few parameters, like I said, power, the cycles per burst, the duty factor, treatment time, and the temperature control. And really the Kavaris, it gives us a lot of flexibility with this system too. Um, the input DNA, it's pretty much independent of the input DNA. One tube could have 50 nanograms, or 50 nanograms, another one can have 250 nanograms. It doesn't matter, they'll still shear within that same vessel, at least that's been our experience doesn't matter what the buffer was, um, it could be tea, water, almost anything, and it'll still shear fine. And just a lot of flexibility, the sample volumes, um, and this the throughput. And again, it's just really tight and reproducible when we actually need to, to do our fragmentation for our DNA samples. <clears throat> and it's really, this is, this is where I give Kavaris a lot of credit for this, is that it's really truly unbiased fragmentation across the genome. There's a lot of enzymatic fragmentation out there, there is still bias in those. It's, it's still evident, there's a lot of papers out there about it, but when you go into a Kavaris, it's just mechanical random fragmentation, which is what you want for NGS testing. So a lot of our, nothing comes without challenges, so we did have a few challenges with integrating this, but a lot of them were questions once we, we started walking through this, is how do we access the Kavaris with collaborative robots? Because at the time, it was the LA220, Plus, there was no opening or anything else on the front of it. Um, how do we automatically process samples um, when we're going to have a variable number of samples per run? Our runs are not 96, they're not 90, they're not predictable. There could be 10 or there could be 50 or nine, up to 94 samples in any run. Um, and that's just based on the volume and turnaround time considerations we have. So how do we, how do we handle that? How can we optimize use of a Kamara's plate? If we're going to have a variable number of samples, we don't want to keep reusing. If I've got five samples, I don't want to use a whole Kavaris plate just for that. <clears throat> and how do we perform the monthly maintenance on the Kavaris? As you saw, our docking mechanism is kind of hard to access the Kavaris if, if it's the front of it's pointed towards a robot. And how do, can we fill a reservoir without moving the system itself? So we worked with... Um, with collaborative robots and it really requires either some sort of API controlled automatic door or a physical opening. So again we worked with Kavaris to develop some standardized solution for the LE220R Plus and you're looking at having a compatible opening for our precise arm, it actually works for most of the collaborative robotics out there, but by adding that addition we also created potentially a safety hazard by now having an opening. So there was an addition of adding a certified light curtain to maintain that security. So if someone tries to stick their hand in there, it will shut off. And we also collaborated on a few changes to the API, um, Sonolab API functionalities. So really we can utilize one program and we can now use it to process either one column or multiple columns without having to call a single program for depending on how many number of columns that we actually have. And this actually solved our problem of optimizing the plate too because now we can just move down the plate and we don't have to change out plates and we can use the same program. So it was a, that was a nice feature that we worked with with Kavaris. And then the monthly maintenance. So Kavaris has a monthly maintenance but there's really two factors of how do we, how do we deal with this maintenance. One is maintenance reduction, and the other was the monthly ease of use. So for maintenance reduction, uh, they have added a thermo cube to these systems. So if you're familiar with the older Kavaras, you had the, the um, antifreeze 
you have to add antifreeze every once in a while. And now it's an entirely water chilled system, so you no longer have to worry about that. And then again with the water conditioner system, which means that you fill it up once, let it run, and it keeps continuously pumping through the system and eliminating any contaminants and things like that. So it really reduces it. I used Kavaris from a long time ago where you had to do the daily or weekly flushes and water bath changes and so it got to be a bit munch after a while. <laughs> And really we have some uh, ease of use thing changes that we made. So we have a user interface screen that we added so that we could um, keep it onto the cart um, so that the users can interact with this to perform the ma monthly maintenance. We had an automatic, automatic reservoir draining so that when, if you've seen the Kavaris, the water level is actually really high up on the, into the water bath that's on the front of the system. So it's, if you're gonna have that and make it mobile, it's going to slosh, it's going to dump everywhere, so we added an automated reservoir draining and there were some um, changes that, we were, that were made in the uh, API also to allow us to turn off the autofill function, which we'll talk about, but, uh, and then to drain the system automatically. And then onboard UPS, so maintenance takes about 45 minutes um, to actually run through the whole um, sys series of things, so we added on a onboard UPS so that users could undock this from our system take it across the, to the sink, perform their maintenance, and then send it back without ever having to worry about this whole system shutting down so everything stays powered um, during the whole process. And how do we actually fill the reservoir without moving the system? So Kavaris has added an automatic, automatic refilling um, function to Sonolab. So there's an autofill mode, so as long as you have a water line connected to it, it'll just constantly refill the system. So we can actually put the system in um, without any water in it at all, and it'll start filling full of water, and I think it's about 45 minutes later, it's full, and it's degassing, and it's ready to go shortly after that. With this new autofill, it just keeps refilling and degasses if it needs to, but the, the system's just always running at that point. And on our side, we actually need to add a separate connector to the deionized water system. So we, we just put in an, a connector separate from the rest of the, the docking mechanism because water and electricity doesn't mix. And so the, it stays in the cart. Cart is plumb, more or less plumbed at all times. And this really, what this does, it always maintains the water level at the correct level. And it drastically reduces the human errors because now there's not someone eyeballing whether the water level is right or not. Now the system just does it automatically and keeps it at the right level. So just a quick summary slide. So again, nucleic acid fragmentation can be really challenging for a diagnostic lab, especially if you've got a lot of sample types and have different specimen qualities. And, but when you're talking about automating your fragmentation, there's a lot of things that need to be considered is reproducibility, your flexibility, robotic access and automated controls, and just user interactions cannot be stressed enough. Your users have to be happy for this system to work. You have to consider that when building these types of systems. And really the Kavaris gave us everything that we needed for this. It gave us great um, the ability to incorporate this into the work cell, gave us reproducible results, and just for this wide range of testing that we have to do, and gave us flexibility and the scalability that we needed. And just a few acknowledgments, um, especially to Kavaris, David Dow, Valentina, and uh, Dan, who have been really helping us a lot with the system and doing a lot of, a lot of collaboration. And then on our side, we have a, a pretty small team that's actually been working on this, but we've got a few of those members here today, but definitely Tony Krasel, who's our electrical engineer, plus he's been the team lead on the system and really you know, bringing this and helping us out a lot. And then Paul, who couldn't be here, but he's our only programmer for doing this whole system. Um, so he definitely worked with Kavaris a lot during that, so thank you all.